Well, the mental health of young people is the greatest challenge facing um, developed and develop, developing countries in terms of health. And the reason for that is um, contained in a paper that was written in Nature a couple of years ago, which uh, points out the, the mental wealth of nations or, or the, um, the social value, social capital in society is dependent on the young people making a successful transition from childhood to adulthood. Societies invest a huge amount in, in, in young people making that transition, getting them to the threshold of productive life. And if they become ill or break down or, or, or even don't fulfil their, their potential, then that's a not just a human cost, but it's also a massive sort of social and economic cost to, to society. And yet, all around the world, there's been tremendous neglect of the health and social needs of young people making this transition, as every family me member would know in the community. And um, that's obviously affecting Australia in just the same way as any other country. And fortunately, in recent years, Australia has begun to recognise this as a major issue. Just some facts and figures about this. 75% um, of, of mental ill health will have appeared by the age of 25, most of it in the period from puberty through to the mid-20s. And yet that's the weakest part of our health system. Um, you know, um, most of the resources that we spend on health are in younger children or in people over 50. And the young people who are physically healthy mostly these days don't get their main health issue addressed, which is mental ill health and, and drugs and alcohol issues. Those are the major threats to their, their health and well-being, as every family member will, will, will know from first-hand experience or through, either through their own kids or through their friends, the, you know, the friends of their kids. So it's a bit of a sleeping giant, actually, in, in most communities. 50% um, of young people will experience a period of mental ill health um, during this transition to adulthood between the ages of 12 and 25. 50%. Now some people will say, well, that just means it's normal, it's just part of the human condition, people should just suck it up. But actually, it's got practical consequences. If we, if we ignore it and treat it in that way, then you know, young people will die, they'll become disabled, and they won't fulfil their potential. So it doesn't make sense to just sweep it under the carpet like we have been doing. Um, the reason people have swept it under the carpet is because they have been confused about what to do. Um, there haven't been obvious solutions and there's a sense of shame or even guilt about what is happening to the young people. And naturally, the young people themselves, um, you know, um, they may not realise what's happening and, and how help might be able to be uh, obtained. When it, when it comes to regional and rural parts of Australia, um, there's a, I've seen communities transformed by um, addressing this issue. People would say before, um, uh, an attempt was made to, to help the young people with mental health problems that um, it couldn't be done, um, rural people are too uh, inward, uh, they're not um, able to open up about um, family problems and, and um, mental health issues, um, and that stigma would be a, a major barrier. But in actual fact, the, the best successes we've seen in Headspace in, in any part of Australia have happened in rural and regional areas where the whole community has got behind the initiative, they realise it's um, it's not a matter of shame or stigma, it's a matter of supporting young people making this difficult transition to adult life and that mental ill health is to be expected during this transition. In, in almost every family um, there's someone with, with um, mental ill health and as I said earlier, 50% of young people will experience some type of mental ill health during the transition. Um, some of it's serious but most of it um, fairly transient that, that will actually resolve in a good way with the right type of help and support. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good news story for rural and, rural and regional Australia and the first thing is to take to the, the initial step, the first step in, 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 um, in setting up the, the approach and you have done that in, in, um, in Foster and um, in South Gippsland uh, by setting up the Youth Assist, Assist Clinic. I've heard stories from that clinic already today, very pro promising stories. Um, it needs a lot more support in terms of professional time and also support for developing that stigma-free, that youth-friendly environment, but also an environment that welcomes families, you know, because families, parents of, of kids who are struggling with this, these, these issues are frantic. They, they don't know where to turn to for help. Um, they think they're the only ones affected by it. They, they, they feel they um, can't talk to people about it. Um, and then life is very difficult for them. 
and um, they put so much energy and support into their children and their children's development. They, 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 um, their children are the most important things to them as parents in their lives. But um, when things start to go off the rails, they, they really don't have anywhere to turn to. So a clinic like this has to be inclusive, not just of young people and, and the youth-friendly approach and the respecting the, in, the individual development of the young people and the trust that goes with that confidentiality, but also welcoming families to to be the key scaffolding and supporting those young people in making the transition to adult life. And, you know, these problems are not, it's not rocket science. We don't have to develop a, a, a brilliant new drug discovery or, or a new gene discovery to actually um, improve outcomes here. We already have the knowledge and expertise. What's missing is the political and community will to do it. One of the most exciting developments in mental health um, around the world in the last 10 or 15 years has been the realisation and discovery that early diagnosis, early intervention is just as important in, in mental ill health as it is in physical health problems. So just as if um, someone who has heart disease or cancer or diabetes, um, the outcomes are much better if you pick up those problems early in the piece and provide you know, um, timely care um, for as long as that person needs it. The outcomes are much better, not just survival, but also quality of life, um, functioning and you know, um, productivity, all those sort of things. We've, we've discovered that in, even in serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia and psychosis, picking it up early is the key to success. And uh, we're getting much better outcomes for, for having this recognition of early diagnosis and then access to comprehensive care from the beginning. Now, it's not exactly rocket science, but it's something that's been shown through scientific research over the last 15 years or so that that is the case. Providing um, health services to young people has to be done in a context. and. Um, is a context of risk for, for these sorts of problems. So that, that means involving w with schools um, and um, I suppose workplaces as well for, for, for the, the emerging adults um, and making sure that risks are minimised, whether they have to do with drug and alcohol use, um, which is obviously a huge issue for young people and often uses self-medication for problems like depression, anxiety and maybe even psychosis. And um, the other major risk factor, I suppose, is, um, is trauma and bullying. Bullying is a very common experience for young people and often translates a vulnerability to mental ill health into reality. And so it's something that can be done um, in school and um, community settings to try to reduce the risk. So as, you, could, you could say a zero tolerance policy for bullying, but perhaps a more, uh, a more understanding approach to drug and alcohol use, but, but understanding that's often the, the, the tip of the iceberg for something under, under, underneath it. And, and again, it's a cultural issue too. Now, in terms of sustainability for um, initiatives like the Youth Assist Clinic, really the, the only long-term source of s sustainability is specific government grants and funding to, to enable these parts of the health service to develop. It, we're talking about a missing element of, of, of health care at the moment. Um, it's as if we suddenly decided we weren't going to look after old people, you know. Well, we've decided, you know, covertly not to look after young people. So that means we've got to actually identify a funding stream which could be headspace um, uh, from the, the federal government side, but the state government also needs to step up and provide adequate resources and also also deal with the workforce issues. Um, that's another key sustainability issue in rural and regional Australia the ability to attract and retain the sort of workforce that's needed for looking after young people. It's not for everybody, um, this sort of work. Only some professionals are able to and have the appetite or affinity for young people, for working with young people, and, and I think that's a key issue. And Obviously, when you get down to smaller communities, it's difficult, more difficult to find those people. But having said that, uh, it's very heartening to see how in so many rural and regional parts of Australia you do find these inspirational people who, who really are committed to the young people of the, of the community and want to make sure the professionals um, uh, are also involved and, and uh, able to, to provide the services. So, yeah, I think it is sustainable, but it's going to take a few issues to be addressed. Money and workforce are, the, are key among those and, and community support is the third one. It's really important for um, community partnerships be, to be developed to, to, to um, 
make it possible for building blocks of, of, of youth mental health care to be developed. So, so that's really important right now before um, a community is able to access a headspace, for example, that the existing partners get together, um, whether it's the hospital, the Medicare local, the, um, the medical and, and allied health professionals in the area, the schools, um, the local politicians, all of these people should be meeting and, and um, planning how they can actually support the young people of this community um, through existing resources to start off with, through fundraising and ultimately through forming a consortium to put together a bid for a headspace centre and other resources that are needed to, to look after the health and social needs of young people. So it does require not just um, commitment, individual commitment from people, but organisational ability to bring the, the key players, the key um, organisations and, and to mobilise the community behind this initiative. Um, this, is, this, is, this is highly achievable, it's been done in many places around Australia already and um, another group that's important are the local journalists, the, the media, um, whether it's radio or, or, or um, print media, um, an internet based approach is now too uh, another key thing. So this is um, possible provided the right leadership and the right um, skill sets are uh, brought to bear on it. One of the big myths that's been around for a long time and is starting to break up at last is the idea that it's not okay to talk about suicide. Um, now suicide is the biggest killer of young Australians up to the age of even 35 or 40. Um, and you know, kills, kills many hundreds um, in this age group every year around Australia, especially in rural and regional areas, high risk. Um, and two and a half thousand Australians die every year from suicide. Yet most people aren't aware that it's a 40% bigger issue than the road toll. And why is that? It's because it's been surrounded by a taboo, by a sense of shame and stigma. Um, and if a suicide does occur in the community, it's, it's covered up. Um, the media are discouraged from reporting it. Um, in, in the mistaken belief that, that um, somehow that's going to reduce the risk of other people killing themselves. I, I think that if we now know that if suicides are reported responsibly and, and honestly, um, that actually it's more likely that suicide risk will go down rather than be increased. We saw this recently in the Albury Wodonga area through the campaign of the Border Mail newspaper, which carried prominent stories of, about suicide um, and the risks associated with it uh, that cause it. Um, for about a six week period and they won a Walkley Award for journalism for doing this. So press councils liberalised its reporting um, uh, approach and guidelines and people are being encouraged now to talk much more openly about it including holding public community meetings of support for people who have been bereaved and to actually identify um, those at risk in the community and provide more support for them. So I think we're seeing a bit of a watershed here which um, is particularly important in rural and re regional parts of Australia because the risks are greater. And obviously, um, when we talk about suicide, what we're trying to find is people who are struggling, people who are really experiencing poor mental health, mental ill health. And this often goes on for a long time before the, the suicide attempt actually um, does, does occur. So again, the good news is there's usually an opportunity to help that person well before they get to the stage of being desperate in this way. So what we have to do is um, get over our sense of taboo and shame and stigma and fear of talking about it and reach out to those who might be struggling and give them some options. You know, and this is why we need um, some professional services that are able to respond in a proactive way and, and not just be put on a waiting list for six months um, um, during which is a, it can be quite a risky period. And also to get the support of the community and the family and friends around them to, to help them see um, there is a future. Um, suicide tragically often takes people who would have been, you know, would have been able to recover within a fairly short space of time and, and be able to get back on with their lives and they'll never have the opportunity to do that because of the, the fact that the, that the transient experience of suicidal risk actually uh, caused their death. So suicide prevention is very possible. Most deaths from suicide are preventable, but we have to really start talking about it. Foster's Youth Assist Clinic opens every Monday afternoon during school term at the Foster War Memorial Hall. Young people can drop in to see an adolescent health nurse, a general practitioner, a sexual health doctor 
or a mental health nurse. This clinic is unique because it offers young people a casual drop-in service that is safe and highly professional. Our major sponsor, the Foster and Tura Community Bank, have been incredibly enthusiastic and supportive. They were prepared to back us before we even opened our doors.